Hey everybody, welcome to the Mobile Games Market Series. Today we'll be talking about the Japanese market and joining us today is the foremost expert in the Japanese market, Sir Khan Toto. We will also be joined by my co-host, Josh Burns, who is a consultant for the Asian gaming market. In our conversation today, we'll be talking about the overall growth of the Japanese market and the split between mobile, console, and PC. We'll be talking about the key players, especially on the mobile gaming side, but also Nintendo. We will also talk about what it takes to be successful in Japan, areas of innovation, and how are foreign companies such as NetEase with Knives Out able to achieve so much success in the Japanese market. So without further ado, let's jump into our conversation with Sir Khan Toto right now. I'm based in uh, Tokyo since uh, 2004, so it, it has been a while. So it's almost like 16 years now, uh, uh, you know, that I've been living here in this uh, in this country, and I've been uh, consulting on the business side uh, to uh, game developers uh, on the Japanese market uh, since around uh, 2010. So it's it's about a decade. Uh, it's about a decade of uh, consulting work that I've been doing for uh, game developers that are interested in the Japanese uh, market. Uh, sometimes Japanese game developers that want to go out of the Japanese market and you know expand it into international markets. Um, so that's one side of my business. The second uh, side of my business is institutional investors uh, that are interested in mostly the publicly traded uh, gaming companies that we have here on the, uh, in the Japanese market. So there's about, it depends on your definition of what a game developer actually is, of how much of, a, you know, how much of the business should be games and then, you know, uh, and then uh, you know what you would call a game developer based on that, but it's around 40 to 50 uh, publicly traded uh, game companies that we have, mostly on mobile. Um, so uh, I basically you know cater to to the to to these two um, you know client groups, institutional investors, but also game developers. Um, and since 2013, I've been doing uh, I've been doing that with my own consultancy that I've uh, set up here in uh, Tokyo. Awesome, got it, great. And so maybe we could go ahead and jump into the questions, but I thought we could start, Sirkan, with like a high level picture of the Japanese market. Could you tell us, uh, you know, could you characterize sort of the overall growth of the market or, or potentially lack of growth? And, you know, just to give a little bit of context, when I was working at Sega a few years back, there seemed to be some concern about the domestic mobile market growth in, in Japan. And really at that time, there was kind of a desire to potentially you know, try to put more focus and emphasis on expanding more internationally just because there was kind of the sphere that the domestic market was going to begin to decline. Mm -hmm. So what's the current state of the Japanese market? Mm. Uh, it's, it, yeah, so, so that's a very interesting, uh, you know, point that you brought up. Uh, so, uh, d but roughly speaking, you know, the Japanese uh, game market overall, every, so all, all of the pillars of the gaming industry included is, uh, you know, depending on which data provider you believe and depending on the currency conversion, it's about 14 billion, 13 billion, 15 billion US, roughly in that ballpark. Of that, around 9 to 10 billion is mobile. Uh, so okay. you have, uh, so I would say that, you know, one unique thing about the Japanese uh, gaming market is that it's so heavily, uh, you know, tilted towards the mobile side. Of course, it's also, mobile is also big in the US and in China, uh, but uh, for example, you know, the, the, the two other markets in the world, uh, you know, uh, uh, that we have, uh, and Japan is the number three. Um, and, but the point that I'm trying to make is, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the distance that mobile has, uh, you know, to, to the other two big platforms that we have in gaming, uh, to PC and, and, uh, and uh, console is, n uh, is uh, not as wide in the US and in China. So you still have, a in China, for example, you still have a relatively healthy PC gaming market. In, in America, you know, people still spend money on console games, on PC games. Here in Japan, you know, disrupted is too strong of a word, but mobile has absolutely taken, uh, taken over uh, the gaming market. That's the point that I'm trying to make. So 70, uh, 70 uh, cent of every dollar spent here in Japan uh, is going to a mobile game developer. And uh, wow. um, and I think that's a really unique about the Japanese uh, a gaming market. Having said that, uh, you know all the data providers that we have here uh, are um, you know are for forecasting for the for the next couple of years that the growth is going to be relatively flat at around nine to ten billion uh, U.S. dollars uh, every year. Got it. And and so. It's flat, and, and based on the market being relatively flat, have you seen a lot of Japanese developers starting to internationalize or start to focus more efforts on, you know, outside of, of Japan markets? 
Uh, yes, so it's really interesting. So you, what you mentioned about Sega. So around uh, 2010 and 2011, you know, you, you, you two uh, you two know this very well, I think, but also a lot of the a lot of the listeners. Uh, you know, uh, DNA and GRI, the two Japanese game companies that actually pioneered mobile uh, free to play mobile gaming globally. You know, these guys were the first out of the gate with that kind of business model on feature yeah. phones back then in Japan. They thought that uh, you know um, uh, you know uh, the market growth in Japan is over. They thought, you know, that they skimmed the market, that they're, they're absolutely dumb. It's, it was a duopoly back then. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, they had a platform, uh, they controlled the platforms on feature phones back then. Um, and they thought that domestic growth for mobile gaming in Japan around 2009, 2010 is over. So they expanded very aggressively internationally. So I don't want to go into a history lesson, but you know they spent a lot of money and you know things like that. Yeah. And it, it, and to make a, uh, to make a long uh, story short, I think that pretty much everybody, including the companies themselves, agree that you know this ended in a catastrophe for them. Uh, you know, right. from a financial perspective. Uh, nowadays, uh, I would say there's a second wave of internationalization because, as you mentioned, you know, uh, uh, you know, the Japanese game developers know that the Japanese game market is limited in size and in scope. Uh, you know, the population is graying um, and shrinking at the same time. Uh, so, uh, from a per from a from a long term point of view, they have to go out of the market. Um, so, there's a second wave of internationalization, I would say. But the second wave of interna internationalization is uh, is different from the first one um, with regards to two things. One is the level of aggressiveness in terms of investment. So you don't see, you know, uh, DNA, Gree, or, you know, any of the other big mobile or video game developers go out to Silicon Valley and buy, you know, uh, uh, studios there for 200, 300, 400, 500 million US. So you don't see that kind of, uh, uh, kind of aggressiveness in spending in, in, in M&A. And the second point is, and this is connected somewhat to the first point, is that, you know, internationalization is uh, being taken home. Right, so all of these guys, Sega, you know, DNA and GRI, you know, that that kind of uh, that kind of international business that you know these companies are uh, are uh, are uh, still uh, operating is operated uh, from their home bases in uh, Tokyo. Right, and then you know, certainly the the market is relatively flat, but are there you know in that's kind of the overall market, but are there any like smaller sub segments of of growth? Any sort of categories where, you know, whether it's like hyper casual or some other area that is growing within Japan? Uh, yes. So I think that, you know, overall, because you mentioned hyper casual, I think that, you know, for a lot of the listeners, I think it's a, it's a must, uh, it's a must hear, uh, you know, at least from my perspective, that uh, the Japanese market in terms of genres, in terms of what you call sub segments, is very different from the rest of the world. Um, so, you know, hyper casual is big, you know, in, in the West, a lot of people are, you know, they are like, they are burning through these games like there's no tomorrow. You know, yeah. that's why you have uh, companies like Voodoo, for example, you know, and like so many hyper casual games, uh, uh, you know, typically dominating the free download rankings. Here in Japan, you know, that genre is, exists. Uh, there are some games also from the West, you know, people are downloading them, people like them, you know, at, to some extent, and, you know, they're playing them. But I would say it's nowhere close to, uh, to, to, the, uh, to the attractiveness of, high, of the hyper-casual hyper category in the West at the moment. In, now it's 2020. Um, and I would, say, I would say that, you know, the one sub-segment that is uh, really big at the moment that is relatively new is a Battle Royale. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of Battle Royale, it's not Fortnite. It's a Chinese-made game called Knives Out from NetEase right. uh, that is uh, dominating uh, dominating the landscape in that in that uh, subsegment. Uh, but uh, I, apart from that, I would say uh, it's still gacha-driven games. It's still puzzle uh, puzzle games. It's uh, it's still role-playing games that you know studios still keep pumping out uh, uh, you know uh, to to the local audience. Right, and then in terms of that, you had mentioned that seventy cents of every dollar flows to mobile. Now that remaining 30 cents, can you comment in terms of the, what, what are those other platforms in terms of like PC relative to various consoles or whatever? Yeah, so I would say that, you know, uh, the console market is, uh, is of course, you know, the second biggest uh, platform in Japan. Uh, and here, uh, 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 Nintendo at the moment dominates. Uh, so right. I, I would actually say that if Nintendo didn't launch a, a you know, hit product with the Switch, um, here, uh, here in Japan, also globally, uh, I would say that the video game market would be even in a, in a, in a worse state than it already is. 
Um, so, uh, so I think that you know Nintendo's uh, market share in the video game market uh, in the video game space here in Japan is around 70, 75 percent or something like that. They have like a wow. ridiculous, ridiculous market. Share. I'm talking about 2019 now. Ridiculous right. market share here here in Japan. So people are buying the Switch like crazy, um, and uh, the PlayStation 4, of course, you know, it's aging. You know, it's it's going towards its uh, towards the end of the life cycle, um, and the PC market is so small that you know. Um, uh, not really many data providers are actually sharing a lot of data uh, data about it. Um, so I would I would estimate that the PC gaming market is one one and a half, one and a half billion US or something like that. So it's about okay. 10, 15, uh, uh, or if if you really want to be generous, maybe twenty percent of what mobile generates, but not a lot more. One follow up. I'm just curious, uh, why is that? Is that I mean, my assumption is it's not like a, a hard you know hardware issue in terms of like having PCs or something like in China, but is it just the content is not you know, appealing or why is PC just never sort of gotten more traction or lost traction, I guess? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, the, the PC is a gaming platform in Japan. You know, people know that, you know, you can play uh, cool games on the PC, you know, you can, you can uh, hyper optimize them, you know, things like that. But I think that the answer to your question is more cultural. Uh, I think that, you know, if you look back uh, at the 1980s, 1990s, uh, you know, where are the, all the big console manufacturers coming from? They're all Japanese, right? Sega, Nintendo, Sony, even, you know, uh, uh, Panasonic, NEC, you know, all of these guys, you know, were manufacturing consoles back then. So they cultivated, uh, cultivated a certain console gaming culture that I think is still dominating uh, until, uh, until today. Um, you know, actually gaming in Japan began on PCs. So you're still in the ni- early 1980s, you, you had a booming gaming uh, PC gaming uh, scene here in Japan, but uh, you know the Famicom ga- uh, came, and then the Super Nintendo came, and then again uh, some other Japanese manufacturers came up with their own consoles. Uh, and I think that you know uh, uh, that's a very unique, um, unique, uh, unique Japanese thing. That there's a, again that there's a certain culture that you know uh, Sega, Nintendo, and uh, Sony in particular were very clever in cultivating over the last couple of decades. Again, it's not that you know nobody is playing games on the PC in Japan, um, but uh, the the market is much much smaller when you compare with uh, mobile, um, and even much smaller when you compare to console. It's not a very popular gaming platform. Right. In, in terms of like some of the blockbuster mobile hits, I mean, here in the States, we've heard of some of them like Monster Strike and Puzzle and Dragons and some of those hits that have actually, cr- you know, kind of crossed over into the West and in, into the U.S. But can you tell us about what are the other hits that we should we should be aware of that are kind of big in Japan, but, you know, haven't crossed over or just aren't within the, you know, the Western cultural context? Uh, yeah, so Puzzle and Dragons came out in February 2012. Uh, you know, Monster Strike uh, was pushed out by Mixi in fall 2013. So these are the two most iconic mobile games that we have in Japan. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, these will be remembered even in 20 or 30 years as the, you know, the first two big games right. that we had on smartphone devices. Uh, and still people are playing them, uh, uh, playing them and also, um, also paying for them. Uh, so in 2018, newer numbers are not ready yet, are not out yet because, you know, it's early 2020, you know, where we're having this interview. But in 2018, Monster Strike made almost 850 million US and Puzzle, Dra- Puzzle and Dragons more, uh, made f- 440 million US. And that's just one country, only in right. Japan. Um, so uh, they are not really losing, uh, dramatically losing steam over time in terms of monetization. But uh, squeezed into these, into these uh, two games is uh, a fake grand order from, uh, from, uh, so- from the Sony studio, Aniplex. Uh, it's not actually a studio. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's basically like a um, entertainment company. So they do music and you know animations and you know uh, and uh, you know uh, cartoons and you know all of those things. But they are publishing um, they are publishing Fake Grand Order, which is you know a role playing game. It's out in English. Everybody can play that. Uh, it, it, uh, the story is a little bit you know it's it, it's it's behind it's behind the it's behind the Japanese original story, but it's a story driven role playing game. It's a gacha game. That's what it is, and that game made uh, in 2018. Uh, it made 800 million US. So I would say that when you talk about the Japanese game market, it's these three big games, um, and then there's a certain gap. Um, and I would say that uh, Knives Out from NetEase, the battle royale game that I mentioned, is coming up right. as the fourth game in terms of ma- making money. Got it. And are, are there any other titles that might be kind of on the horizon or emerging that uh, we should look out for? Uh, yeah, I would say that uh, the one title, uh, you know, for in this context is uh, Dragon Quest Walk from uh, Square Enix. 
Um, right. So Square Enix is the publisher, Colopo, uh, Colopo, C-O-L-O-P-L. Is, it's another big, uh, you know, a publicly traded mobile game co- developer uh, that we have here. They actually pr- produce the game. They're, so, uh, they're operating the game. It's basically uh, what people call a Pokemon Go clone uh, based on the Dragon Quest, uh, on the Dragon Quest IP. It's a totally different game, actually. But, uh, you know, um, uh, to make it short, people are calling it the Pokemon Go clone for Dragon Quest, uh, Dragon Quest fans. And this, that, one is, uh, that one is a big one. So, uh, you know, right. uh, Square Enix uh, published it a couple of months ago uh, late, in late uh, 2019. And as we speak, it's, it's, I think it's still one of the top three uh, grossing uh, games in Japan on both iOS and uh, Android. I'll ask a couple of follow-ups kind of leading into the sort of discussion of the local companies. So, um, you know, I think one topic that's, you know, definitely comes to mind is, you know, you have like a Mixi and, uh, you know, um, Gung Ho, these sort of breakout hits that sort of defined, you know, the market for a period of time. And, um, and then it's, you know, haven't been able to sort of follow up with any, um, anything really from what I've seen. Again, I'm obviously a world away. I mean, uh, you know, can you talk about some of the, you know, how are these guys working to build like new content that can, you know, match the success? I mean, obviously we're in a hit driven business, but, yes. um, you know, when I, when I look at their, you know, app store accounts and stuff, I don't see them even, you know, testing games or, you know, trying stuff out. So I'm just curious, kind of like, you know, a lot of these guys have, haven't been able to sort of follow up um, with the next thing that's even maybe, you know, even second tier to their hit. Can you talk a little bit about that and mm-hmm. what you've seen? Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, yeah, so, so what you mentioned is, is a very uh, popular topic with institutional investors, you know, that, uh, you know, look for the, for the next growth driver for these, uh, for these companies. And, uh, you know, when I'm in a snarky mood, I'm telling them, you know, look, these two companies uh, are basically one game management companies. Because this is what they essentially, from a commercial perspective, this is what they are. You know, it's, they are publicly traded. You know, you can look into their financial, uh, financial data. Uh, you know, the, uh, all the money comes from these games. Um, and all the other, you know, smaller games and other businesses that, that they are operating are basically like, uh, they're only like uh, generating loss for, for these companies. So they actually would make, uh, would, uh, you know, would uh, uh, perform better from a financial perspective if they, uh, if they just operated uh, these two games and did nothing else. Um, um, and I would say that the answer to your question is what, uh, uh, that Gangho and Mixi are two totally different companies. So Gangho has always been uh, a game company. This is a real studio where, where there's a, a DNA where people are, are, are all about games. Um, and, you know, they never ventured into, uh, uh, you know, um, into taxi services, for example, like DNA did. Uh, they never ventured into, uh, into real estate portals like Greed did. Uh, they never ventured into uh, uh, venture, uh, you know, venture capital uh, is, is something that uh, that both we and GRI, uh, DNA and a couple of other mobile game companies are also are also doing here in Japan. I mean, imagine Zynga in the United States becoming a VC. But this is this is what uh, this is what uh, several mobile game companies are doing because uh, they struggle with finding a follow up success to the to the uh, to the big game that defined them. But I think that Gang Ho uh, again, it, it's an actual game studio. They were already publicly traded before before uh, Puzzle and Dragons hit the Japanese market in early 2012, and they're still trying. But I would I would agree with your assertion that uh, that uh, you know they are not producing enough games. So uh, if I was an investor, or if I was looking at the company, I would also ask myself the same question. Why are you not trying more? You know, why, should, why are you not, you know, you're not uh, a prototyping more and just putting games out there and just see if they work, but they are not really doing that. With Mixi, it's actually a different story. They also tried uh, to release and they actually did release a couple of uh, uh, smaller games after Monster Strike. It didn't work. So now Mixi is, and this is all public information. So now Mixi is looking at other businesses um, and uh, they want, just as an example, uh, they want to uh, 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 get into uh, uh, gyms into sports gyms, you know, where you actual physical gyms and they are saying, well, you know, it kind of still makes sense because we want to uh, uh, put a dash of competition into, into that business. Uh, so the idea is that you go inside and then you, you, uh, you know, I don't know, you, you, you lift weights and then, you know, the next day your friend sees your score and he, he tries to uh, lift more weights. And so they want to have a certain like ga- gamify that kind of experience. Yeah. And believe it or not, they're looking at uh, getting into that physical gym kind of business. Um, 
And again, imagine Zynga doing that in the US. I mean, it's unthinkable, right? But yeah. uh, here in Japan, I think that, you know, uh, these companies are making so much money and they have trouble uh, with the traditional gaming business that they venture into all sorts of different businesses. But again, Gangho is not, do uh, is not doing that. Got it. Yeah, I mean, I remember always seeing like Konami and they have like a similar, like a di very diversified businesses that we don't really realize until you look into the details. Uh, yes. it, was, it was interesting. Um, cool. Yeah. Well, so I'd love to sort of go a little bit deeper on the, the local companies. Um, I mean, I think, uh, you know, companies like Square Enix and a lot of these are familiar to people, but, um, you know, who are the sort of biggest players in the market? Um, and has that sort of stayed consistent over the last couple of years as the market has, um, you know, people have had difficulty having replicate replicating success. You know, we talked about green DNA. Yeah. We'd just love to hear your sort of overview of where things are at and what are the companies that, you know, have come and gone and what are the ones sort of at the top right now? Sure, sure. Uh, so I would say that uh, that if, if you look at, uh, you know, the mobile game industry from, uh, uh, you know, from a helicopter perspective, I think you can you can uh, um, think about it as, as a pyramid. It's very different in the US because in the, diff in the US, you don't have that many publicly traded mobile game companies. Um, and in, in here in Japan, I would say the top layer is around uh, consists of two groups. So one is the uh, is the traditional video game developers. We have around seven or eight of them that are publicly traded: Nintendo, Sega, Konami, Capcom. They, uh, they all of them, including Nintendo, uh, do uh, mobile games. So that's one part of the of the top of the pyramid. The other part is around six to seven purely mobile game uh, uh, game companies that purely focus on mobile uh, on mobile gaming on smartphone gaming. Uh, for example, uh, Mixi, Gangho, uh, Colopol, the uh, you know uh, the company that uh, that I just uh, mentioned, um, and these are large cap companies. So uh, 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 their market value is uh, uh, one billion or even higher. Um, so you'd be talking about, I think, up to four or five billion or something like that. And you have around five to six of them. Uh, so you have that kind of small elite group on the top of the pyramid that sits on these, uh, you know, legacy console business uh, IPs. And the other group has uh, uh, consists of uh, companies that had, uh, you know, the one or the other big um, you know, mobile first uh, uh, game uh, success a couple of years ago, and then there's a middle. Then the, in the middle of the in the middle of the pyramid, you have uh, the, the the publicly traded uh, companies that I mentioned before. So if you take out the ones that we talk about, there are about uh, around thirty of them. Uh, so they're like these mid-sized publicly traded mobile game focused uh, companies that we have in Japan. And then on the bottom of the pyramid, there's a huge container uh, where the pri uh, private private uh, you know, studios are uh, located. And I would say you have uh, several hundred of them, excluding outsourcing and excluding, you know, companies that are focused on uh, servicing uh, of on life operations of, of mobile games, et cetera, et cetera. Purely companies that are actually, uh, you know, creating games from A to Z and push them into the market. You probably have several hundred of them. Um, and then you have another another container, so, so to speak, in that, in, that, in that bottom container that consists of the foreign game companies that come uh, into the Japanese market. And that container has been, has been uh, growing bigger and bigger over the last couple of years. Interesting, okay. And so basically if we look over uh, sort of, you know, the last four or five years, it seems like, um, you know, you, so you still would put like a Mixi and a, uh, in, in that top bucket, even though they haven't sort of been able to replicate um, any sort of, you know, additional hit just because the scale is still so big. Yes. Yes. Okay. I mean, the scale and the, uh, what do you call it? The mind share is just still so big. You know, everybody here, here in Japan, you know, there's 130 million people are living here, right? It's the, uh, you know, Japan is the 10th biggest uh, uh, country by population. So it's a huge, it's a huge domestic market that we have here. Um, that's why you can make so much money, you know, just by operating the game in one, in one country. Um, and apart, you know, from, uh, apart from uh, the Japanese uh, being the, the, the highest uh, spenders in terms of ARPPU. Uh, so you have, uh, you know, they spend a lot of money on on, on uh, Japanese people spend a lot of money on mobile games. So if you have a spender, you, 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 they spend a lot. Um, and uh, Mixi and Gangho, I would still call them absolutely the elite because of the scale uh, of, of the audience that they have, because of the mindshare that they're controlling. Um, and uh, of course, also because of the market value. Okay, got it. Um, and in terms of like looking into the future, uh, you know, who do you see as being sort of best positions for, for success? I mean, we talk about you know, you talk about puzzles and dragons and, and Monster Strike being able to sustain for a long time. But mm -hmm. um, I mean, 
can that, do you think that can change quickly with the right, you know, new content in the market? Or do you think that these kind of things can coexist even if, you know, the new, new titles come in, um, mm-hmm. and who, and, and, and who do you think is best positioned based on their strategy, um, for, for new content in the mobile space? Right. Uh, yeah, I think that, you know, globally speaking, it's, it's been a, you know, a very hot topic for a long, long time that the top of the grossing charts are always like cemented. You know, you see, see always the same guys, always the same companies and always the same, you know, titles, et cetera, et cetera. I would say that this is more true in Japan than anywhere else. Uh, just talking about Asia now, um, you know, if you look at the Korean market, you know, if there's a, no, a new MMORPG in town, you know, people right. are like switching over, right? And, they, they, uh, and, you know, that's why you see a lot of flow in the, in the top in, at the top of the grossing charts, uh, you know, in in Korea, it's um, you know to some extent it's similar it's similar in China, but here in Japan, so many g- triple A mobile games, you know, with the biggest IPs that you can think of, came and went, came and went, came and went over the last eight years. You have to say now, if you look at Puzzle and Dragons, for example, which is over like uh, uh, seven years and eleven months old now, um, at at the point of this interview, um, and uh, but you know these two uh, these two games in particular, they've been holding uh, they've been holding uh, you know their positions for such a long time now. They're still you know printing money for the for the studios every day, um, uh, and I would say that uh, I would say that you know these games became uh, part of a lifestyle. Uh, for a lot of Japanese people. And uh, it looks to me that uh, uh, Japanese users are more loyal, uh, more engaged, uh, you know, when they, if they, if they see if they see a, a game that kind of like fits their lifestyle, that you know fits how they how they think about games, that you know is you know according to their taste, uh, they stick to it. And uh, uh, and I think that uh, in in the in the past couple of years, uh, there's been um, of course you know new games new games came came into the market, uh, but if you look at the top ten uh, you know top grossing uh, you know. Uh, apps um, in 2018 or also for that matter in 2019, very, very uh, few of these apps are actually new. Got it. Got it. And from a company perspective then, I mean, is there any companies that you think are best positioned um, or it seems like it's not necessarily, it's kind of usual suspects since there isn't a lot of change uh, that you can anticipate. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, uh, for the private uh, companies that I mentioned earlier, you know, that are kind of like on the bottom of that pyramid, it's going to be very, very difficult, I think. You know, uh, the, the production costs are rising. Uh, so if you ask any, any Japanese uh, g- game developer now, uh, the, you know, the benchmark is usually, uh, usually $10 million. Uh, for a trip, I'm not not you know for a, you know for a casual puzzle game or something like that. I'm talking about a triple A kind of role playing game experience for the version 1.0 that you you can push into the market. Um, it's it's around nine to ten million US. What a lot of people are also publicly actually actually sharing with uh, uh, sharing with other people. Um, and you know you, you cannot play that game anymore if you're a private if you're a private game company. And that's also one of the reasons why even companies like Gango and Mixi are not you know they, they are not able apparently to push out five games and see what sticks or doesn't stick. That was, right. uh, that was possible uh, a couple of years ago, but nowadays it's a lot more uh, difficult also because the marketing costs are rising. Here in Japan, you know, without TV commercials, you cannot land a, he- land a big hit nowadays. It's not, po- uh, it's not possible. But to answer your question more concretely, I would say it's still one of the, if there's a next hit, I think it's going to come uh, from one of the top uh, uh, companies that I mentioned that are on the top of the pyramid. I think that even even in the middle layer, it's going to be really really really, really difficult. Uh, I think that you know on paper, Nintendo is the best positioned company to do uh, uh, to to land a big hit, but apparently the company's management is uh, focusing on the Switch now. They are really not really focusing on mobile. Okay, interesting. Yeah, well, I'm going to go to Nintendo next. But one because I one quick other comment because I was surprised to hear you say that Colopole, which you know had some very successful games, they're actually having to partner with you know a larger company my assumption is because of the the cost structure to launch to build and launch these games would be one of the reasons that they wouldn't do it on their own but that would you say that's true for like the the dragon uh quest walk game um yeah i think there's two things about this one thing is that colopal had a string of flops uh okay. you know recently and you know they were they were focusing on the on the on, on vr for a long time for about two years or something like that and that came from the management that came from the ceo it's a very good developer uh, but I think that, you know, they kind of like lost their way in the last uh, two, uh, two, two, I would say two to three years, the market value is like, if you look at the stock price, it just cratered 
until until Dragon Quest walked. They got destroyed by the market, by the stock market, uh, because of that string of flops that they produced. People were, thought that you know they're out. Um, and I think that uh, when Square Enix, uh, you know, approached them, you know, with that with that kind of idea, they just jumped on it because they have very good talent inside the company. Um, and uh, uh, I think that the second point is that Square Enix is very famous for outsourcing developer uh, development uh, to other game companies. It's a very unique company. Uh, in, it's a very unique uh, company in that way. So a lot of the a lot of the games when you know when you use uh, uh, you know um, certain services you know to check uh, to check one kind of uh, uh, apps. Uh, you know, Square Enix is operating in Japan. So, Square, as you know, Square Enix is, uh, is appearing as the publisher, but the development, yeah. very, very few games are actually developed by Square Enix. Uh, so, Dragon Quest Walkers by Colopol, uh, the various Final Fantasy games that are out, uh, free to play Final Fantasy games out are co from companies like Gumi, for example. Um, and uh, for, uh, for Square Enix, Colopol is just a random partner. I think they would also have uh, uh, partnered up with Gumi if uh, uh, Colopol would have uh, uh, told them no. Got it. Okay, so yeah, before we, we, we want to jump into sort of the content trends, uh, but uh, you know, obviously we want to talk a little bit about Nintendo. Um, I think from the you know, mobile gaming side, everyone's kind of wondering what's going on. They're trying lots of different stuff. You know, coming from a market... Uh, like Japan, which is so focused on, you know, gotcha monetization and, and, you know, but they're sort of seem to be trying other stuff. Would love to hear your comments, what you see happening around the mobile side for Nintendo um, or not happening, I guess, too. And then would, you know, any comments around sort of the obviously other parts of the business, the switch and, and anything else you think is, is interesting to, to talk about? Sure. So, so, so I think that you know, in uh, in March 2015, you know, Nintendo uh, announced their entry into mobile with DNA as the as the mobile partner. I was at the press conference. It was five minutes away from uh, from where I'm speaking to you right now. I was in the press com uh, conference. I was sitting in the second row, and I couldn't believe my eyes, um, and uh, that Nintendo is finally getting into mobile. I he, so so here's what I think. I think that uh, Nintendo is not taking mobile seriously. And I can, I, can, I can also tell you why. You know, now it's January 2020. As I mentioned, you know, the, the announcement, initial announcement was from, is from March uh, 2015. And I believe the number of free-to-play games uh, that Nintendo published by now is uh, five. And I think that you know, this tells you everything that you want to know about Nintendo's mobile ambitions. I think they are compl not completely, but almost completely focused on making uh, the Switch a platform. Uh, and you know, making that an even bigger success going forward, and you know, and nurturing that kind of uh, uh, that side of their business. I think that inside the uh, uh, mobile, and I I believe it's not hyperbole when I say that it looks like uh, mobile is viewed uh, as kind of a stepson uh, in terms of in terms of business by uh, by Nintendo. And you know, as as another example, you know, Nintendo launched um, um, uh, Mario Kart Tour as their big game. As the, you know, assuming like a big game in fall last year, and now it's January 2020, and you know that game still doesn't have a multiplayer mode. It's absolutely ridiculous, right? It's a multiplayer game that Nintendo launched uh, without a multiplayer mode, and it's still not implemented. Um, and uh, at this point, uh, at, at at the point of the recording, nobody even knows what Nintendo's uh, next mobile uh, mobile game is going to be. They haven't announced anything. They're, so public. On, from a public perspective, uh, the, Nintendo's uh, uh, pipeline is empty uh, with regards to the mobile business. I, again, I think, that, uh, I think that if you want to be extremely friendly to them, you can say there's a lot of upside for Nintendo on mobile. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, got it. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Obviously, historically, the platform sort of strategy was, you know, I think maybe that's why they held out so long uh, on the smartphone side for, but um cool jk do you want to jump into the sort of the content distribution uh, trends Arkan, you kind of uh, mentioned a bit in terms of what some of the popular genres were but i thought we could dig into that in a little bit more detail and so with respect to uh both mobile and, and maybe also uh console could you talk about what are you know the key genres themes art styles that tend to resonate the most in the japanese market and to your point about the market being a little bit stagnant maybe it hasn't been changing a lot <laughs> but um is it basically rpg gotcha collection i think that uh, you know uh, by far uh, the number one genre is uh, role-playing games 
um, and this is true for console and uh, and uh, for mobile gaming. Um, and uh, you know, I've asked my friends why. You know, why is role playing games so? I'm not Japanese. You know, I've been living in Japan for a long time, but obviously, I'm not. Uh, I've, I haven't been, you know been brought up. Uh, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, been educated under the, under the Japanese system. You know, I was born and raised in in Germany. Um, uh, so I asked my friends. You know why are you why are Japanese people like so focused on role playing games? And they told me, you know, look, we like stories, we like characters, we like narratives, etc., etc. Et I told, yeah, what everybody does. And they told me, yeah, but for us, you know, uh, it's escapism because our life is so structured. There's so many authorities around us all the time. You know, there's our boss, there's our you know our, our teacher at at school, and uh, you know our university professor, and we want want to escape that kind of like harsh. Uh, you know, harsh uh, business world, for example, you know, when you're an office worker, you want to go, um, you know, and uh, get into the metro and play Monster Strike um, right. or play your Puzzle and Dragons, you know, right. with all of these shiny characters and, you know, escape into that kind of world. So that's, that's basically the, the, best, uh, the best explanation I heard about why that, uh, why that genre is so popular in Japan. But again, it, it, it's the same for, uh, for consoles as well. It's not only uh, on, on, on mobile. Um, and I think, I think what, uh, what uh, you know, in terms of uh, mechanics, I think after all of these years, uh, collection is still a big one. I mean, right. the reason why people are playing uh, Fate Grand Order, Monster Strike, Puzzle and Dragons, it's not about the puzzle or the pinball or the, you know, kind of like a fighting game kind of, kind of mechanics uh, or the role-playing kind of game kind of mechanics that are on all of these games. I think it's about, uh, uh, you know, collecting characters um, and, uh, and specifically about collecting characters uh, via gacha. That's a completely different culture in terms of uh, gaming culture uh, when you uh, when you compare that uh, when you compare that with the West. And certainly, in terms of themes, I think even in the West, fantasy tends to be number one. I would assume it's number one in Japan. But are there any other sorts of themes, whether it's you know sci-fi or pirates or you know ninjas or whatever, that tend to do better in Japan as well? Uh, yeah, so so ninjas and you know uh, shogun and you know all of these all of these uh, imageries uh, or all of these uh, kind of like uh, uh, you know um, uh, themes are not really popular in Japan, you know, and that's why I always tell uh, you know because some of my clients think you know they they, they can uh, put some of the characters into uh, you know uh, into ninja into ninja suits and then you know that would actually appeal to the Japanese market that 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 never works right that absolutely never works uh in japan i would say uh it's a really a very fantasy driven you know if you look at the app store icons right I and mean, we look at the app store icons here in japan look at the top grossing charts look at the app store icons uh they're all dragons uh, right. girls or guys that look like girls right okay. like androgynous androgynous characters it's really it's really really interesting completely different from from the west where you have like barbarians with you know the eyes with the eyes and the and their mouths wide open you know the typical right. like Action cliche out. kind yeah. of like clash of clans kind of like uh, icons um it's really really interesting so it's 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 uh, very, of course obviously very anime driven so so the imagery is very very different from from the more kind of like uh, cartoony realistic uh, sometimes even realistic looking uh, uh, you know uh, you know themes and imageries that we have in the west um, but uh, yeah, it's very, very unique. And yeah, uh, uh, the, the taste is very unique in Japan. Right. And then in terms of any innovation, whether it comes to gameplay or monetization, you, you mentioned Knives Out, which would be kind of different from your typical, you know, RPG gotcha collection type of game. Is that, is that more of an outlier or are there other forms of innovation coming into the, to the gaming market? Um, yeah, I mean, people are trying, right? I mean, people are trying with uh, different uh, different sorts of uh, different sorts of uh, uh, genres. But I think that uh, uh, most of the uh, most of the game uh, game studios in Japan uh, they're trying to play it safe, and I can kind of understand it because uh, because uh, you know uh, the development costs and again the marketing costs are so high nowadays uh, that uh, you know as a, as a as a game creator it's. It, it's getting difficult, you know, to get a, to get a green light for your project if you come up with a with an outlandish kind of with an outlandish kind of uh, you know concept. That's why a Chinese studio, NetEase, has has uh, is uh, kicking uh, kicking butt here in Japan with with the battle royale game. A Japanese company should have done that. A Japanese right, company right. should have done that, right? I mean, they should have come with a locally made battle royale game and pushed that into the market. Gung Ho or Mixi, for example, they have the resources, right? Uh, right. But, uh, but it was actually a Chinese company that brought that kind of like innovation, uh, finally a new genre into, in, into, the, into, 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 the Japanese, into the Japanese mobile gaming market. Um, so I would say to, to answer your question more directly, I would say that it's still a lot of role-playing games 
um, and the, the games all look the same, to, at least to me. So I don't see I don't see any kind of uh, any kind of uh, you know interesting interesting approaches from uh, you know from production value perspective or from an approach uh, like uh, you know for, for uh, like new approaches or like new concepts or something like that. Um, it's always uh, more of the same, I would say, from from uh, from uh, from uh, Japanese companies. I, I think they're trying to, to play it too safe. This is why I personally believe that over time, uh, you know, the Korean and the Chinese uh, studios uh, that are coming into the Japanese market will take m even more market share that uh, uh, than uh, than they have been already taking away from the local developers in the last uh, two to three years. And you, sorry, one quick follow-up. So, would you say the primary driver of the sort of playing it safe is really that high high price point when you talk about the ten million to build a game is? Is that you think is like the primary reason behind the sort of following what we've been doing forever? Uh, yeah, I think this is one. The other part is uh, I think the the Japanese business culture. It's it's you know it's like more conservative, more slow moving. You know, uh, less open. I would say to innovation, at least at least in, in, in uh, at least to some extent. Uh, you know, of course, you can make the argument that back then uh, Gang Ho came up with that idea of pushing out a puzzle uh, puzzle and role playing game hybrid. You know, back then it was like uh, never, never, nobody has has done that before, and the game has actually uh, been created by a person who has never created a, a mobile game before. So he came from Hudson, you know, the the old established uh, video game company uh, that was uh, most famous, I think, in the 1980s. Um, and you know, that guy was tasked with uh, creating a mobile game, and he came up with that innovation. Um, you know, but back then it was an innovation. Nowadays, I would say, if you look at the games. Um, I think because of the culture that I mentioned, because of the cost factor that I mentioned, and because of the fact that so many of the studios are now publicly traded, um, I think that actually intensified uh, that kind of uh, conservative culture in, in, in these companies that uh, I think that, um, you know, outlandish or like innovative, uh, innovative approaches are difficult to find, I would say. Certainly the, the PC console market is smaller in Japan, but... You know, in, in the West, we, we've got some big hits like whether it's Fortnite or Apex Legends and games like that. Do those, how do the Japanese, you know, react to some of those games? Are, are they also popular in Japan or are they not hitting very much? It's getting better. It's getting better. Uh, so, uh, so, so, you know, franchises like the ones that you mentioned or Call of Duty, for example, or GTA 5, Japanese gamers know them. You know, they appreciate the production value. They appreciate the attention to detail that are in, in, in these games. Um, and I would say that, you know, over the last uh, 10, 15, 20 years, uh, the, Jap uh, the uh, Western developers have caught up and in many cases actually, uh, you know, um, taken over. Uh, the, the Japanese uh, console game makers in terms of production value and you know uh, uh, the the way that the games look and uh, the, the way that they play um, and uh, so many great Western games nowadays out um, and this this used to be different you know when I was in high school you know um, I, in high school for example in the 1990s you know Japan was the mecca of of video games right I mean the best games came from Japan etc cetera, etc cetera. that has changed a lot over the last couple of years and I think that again even Japanese users are appreciating that so when a new Call of Duty comes out, for example. It it does chart in the video game uh, in the video game uh, rankings here in in Japan. People are buying it, but not at that scale. I would say that in video games, it's very similar to uh, mobile games. Local content is by far the most popular. Right, and then kind of shifting gears a little bit, but talking about kind of marketing, promotion, distribution. You know, I remember from my days at Sega that it, it did seem like the launches in Japan were different from the West in terms of like not having like a soft launch, for example, and having like a much stronger emphasis on having like a big launch and big promotion and, and that sort of thing. But could you speak to, you know, how the typical, you know, mobile launch happens in Japan? So soft launches are out of the question because, uh, you know, the, the launches have to be in Japan. The games are Japanese only, and Japan is the only country in the world where people are speaking Japanese. Uh, so right. you cannot really soft launch <laughs> in, uh, in Australia. <laughs> right. I mean, you, you cannot really also soft launch in Australia or the Philippines yeah. or whatever. That, that, that uh, you know, that, uh, that's not, uh, uh, that, that's not uh, possible, especially for the hyper-local games that, you know, have yeah. Japanese themes and, you know, things like that. Uh, so what, uh, what happened, uh, uh, I think, uh, after, after the time that you left Sega was that, uh, uh, you know, uh, before that, before that, it was like, like you said, you know, big launches, uh, big launches, were lo big games were launched in a big way. Um, you know, sometimes with the TV commercials from day one, you know, on the same day when, you know, the game launched in the app stores, you know, there was a TV commercial kicking off, campaign kicking off. And nowadays, because of, you know, the cost that, you know, we're talking about the rising, 
what Japanese ga game companies are doing is, or increasingly doing is, especially for the gig, big games is, they are doing, li uh, they're doing beta testing. You mm. know? So that has never really happened until two, three, two and a half years ago, something like that. I think they started really uh, you know, picking up steam in late 2018, mid 2018, that you know, the big games uh, were launched after, uh, you know, after the, the studios uh, operated uh, the game for two, three months with 10,000, 20,000, 5,000 people. So that has, has clearly changed. And I, I think this is still the case. And then, you know, it goes back to the studio and then, you know, people at uh, the studios is tweaking, is tweaking the, the game mechanics like, like you would imagine, the monetization mechanics like you would imagine. And then, you know, the, the big launch happens. Nintendo also did the, thing, uh, did, did the same thing with uh, Mario Kart Tour. Um, uh, so uh, I think that, uh, I think that uh, better testing is the escape for uh, uh, for uh, Japanese uh, game companies that cannot do soft launches like Western companies can uh, can do. Right, and maybe one last question with respect to this section in terms of like regulatory changes, or I, I mean, you know, I, I think you know uh, from a few a number of years back there was that regulation around CompuGotcha, for example. Here mm -hmm. in the West, there seems to be a lot of regulation around you know um, collection of data, ad targeting as well as you know, social casinos, some states are trying to outlaw some of that stuff. Yep. Are, is there any sort of big regulatory or legal thing in, in Japan that we should be aware of? Uh, yeah, so, so uh, the, the Kampu Gacha scandal in 2012 was the, bi uh, was the big and so far only scandal you know, um, that revolves around, around mobile gaming. After that came and you know, the government uh, uh, forced, uh, forced the studios to self-regulate themselves, uh, you know, the public discussion has died down. Of course, you know, that you, you will always find the one or the other journalist or the one of the, uh, the other critical blogger, you know, speaking about, about mobile gaming monetization, about gacha mechanics being unfair and, you know, and being, you know, potentially illegal and things like that. But the big discussion has never really taken place after 2012. So it has been for a long, long time, very, very quiet. Uh, this is also something to do with the fact that social casino games in the West are big. You know, there are some developers that are huge in the West as you as you know, um, uh, that only do social ga casino games here in Japan. Uh, a social casino, genre, of course, there are social casino games, but almost nobody's playing them. So the genre is a little bit like hyper casual. You know, there are people do, uh, you know that are, are playing uh, you know social casino games, but it's not really a big segment of the of, of the market. So the uh, the uh, the you know the uh, the the urgency is just not there to actually deal with the subject because of that uh, lack of popularity. Uh, uh, I would say that uh, uh, that in Japan we are still very very far away from the regulation uh, regulation that you see in China, for example, or in even Korea, where where the gaming industry is heavily regulated, not only in terms of monetization, but also in terms of engagement. Uh, so just uh, a couple of days ago, the first prefecture here in Japan, um, you know, has, um, is trying to get some regulation on its way. Uh, you know, they're trying to limit the time uh, that, uh, you know, mobile games can be played by minors. Uh, but so far, you know, you can play as many games, even as a minor, as many games in Japan as you want um, and uh, spend as much money as you want without uh, the game or the studio or you know uh, anybody is stopping you very very liberal at this point actually so first sorry one follow-up question on the marketing side so you know uh my assumption is sort of this game launch scale is you know you see you know i i make the analogy of like a movie release in the u.s is kind mm -hmm. of this i mean you talked about maybe like a 10 million dollar development budget i mean uh, my assumption is they're probably spending that or more potentially on marketing to launch those games. Can you give any sort of range in terms of what you are hearing or seeing around this, these marketing budgets for these sort of AAA mobile games? Uh, yeah. So if you really have a big AAA mobile game like Dragon Quest Walk, for example, um, I think that it's in the millions U.S., when, when the, the initial launch campaign, uh, you know, usually these games, uh, these really big, not every mobile game, you know, launches in Japan in a big way. There's just too many of them as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, if you really talk about a really triple A mobile game, like, just like Dragon Quest Walk, for example, uh, you know, uh, I, I think that a TV commercial campaign is inevitable. Um, and, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, you know, uh, there was one a study where, you know, where, where, you know, people looked at the top 50 grossing games in Japan, 
that don't use TV commercials, you know, as, as, a, as, a, as a UA channel. And I think the number was only at two or three of them or something like that. So over 90% uh, of, of, uh, of the games out there that are really making money, that are on the top of the, on, on top of the you know, system in terms of, uh, you know, making money for, uh, for, uh, for the studios, they're using t t TV, um, you know, uh, uh, t the TV as the, as the main channel. That's really difficult to do in the US because in the US you have different time zones, you know, you have all of these different, you know, cable Cable TVs, uh, cable TV channels, and all of these different, uh, and it's a, it's a much, much bigger country, much, much easier to do here in Japan. If you just focus on Tokyo, for example, you already have focused on 40 million people that are using public transfer, transportation all the time. And, you know, that might, you know, go and download the game and play it uh, on the next day in, in the train. Um, and for that, TV commercial campaigns, uh, it's usually one, two, th uh, one to two million U.S., if you want to have a celebrity uh, promoting promoting your game, just like you know King did when they launched uh, Candy Crush here in Japan, they use the celebrity, um, and people are telling me if you do that, you have to add one million more, um, you know, as a, as a kind of like ambassador for that game, and then you are like you know for a nation a, a nationwide TV commercial campaign that maybe goes like two weeks or something like that, you know, to 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 accompany the the launch probably two or three million or something like that. Also depending on the rotation and how many times, you know, the frequency of the ads and things like that. And then of course you have the usual UA channels. Um, and uh, the biggest UA channels here are mostly, mostly uh, very similar to the US, YouTube, Google, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Um, and I think that uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, that's also also the reason, by the way, why a lot of the successful uh, not there's not too many, but you know the successful Western uh, Western developers are mostly controlling UA from their home bases, uh, because uh, the local UA channels that we have here in Japan, like Line, for example, you know the, our top messaging application, or you know the one or the other ad network that focuses on uh, focuses on the local ad network that just focuses on focuses on the Japanese uh, on Japanese traffic. Um, you know, you don't really need uh, these, uh, these, uh, uh, you know, uh, these uh, platforms or these ad channels uh, to, to launch a hit in a, uh, to launch a game in a big way in, in the Japanese market. You can do that all with uh, Western, uh, with Western distribution channels, except for TV. Got it. Okay, great. So yeah, I think, you know, obviously a lot of our listeners are in, uh, you know, the United States or, you know, some of the Western markets and, you know, they, they hear, oh, Japan, you know, Japan, it's a, uh, you know, top three, top five market. Um, and they're obviously very interested in trying to be successful there. So, you know, I think, uh, we've talked a lot about sort of the differences in terms of the content and themes and, um, you know, the genres, but you know, what, you know, I think the key question here is like, you know, what have you seen sort of foreign, like maybe focusing on Western developers do, yeah. um, to be successful, um, you know, I think be curious, you know, what some of the higher profile ones have done to be successful, like Supercell or King. And then, mm -hmm. you know, maybe if you have any insights around, I always like to say like, you know, sort of more easily accessible, affordable things that you can do to, to be successful in Japan, you know, we'd love to kind of hear, you know, both sort of, uh, categories. Uh, for sure, sure. Uh, I mean, I would say that, you know, generally speaking, uh, the, uh, the Japanese market is considered to be uh, one of the toughest ones to crack for a good reason. I would say that, you know, uh, I would say that the toughest one to crack, Asian ones, maybe, you, 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 Josh, I know you do a lot of work around this too, but my personal ranking is the, the first one, uh, the, the toughest one to crack is China, uh, then uh, Korea, uh, uh, sorry, then Japan, and then Korea. That's that's my personal uh, that's my personal ranking, uh, and for the Japanese market, uh, I would say that, that you know, um, I want to try I try to avoid like uh, like a really like two tough words, but uh, it's almost a blood trail. It's almost a blood trail of Western developers, especially the ones that actually opened offices here, and the biggest one is uh, Zynga. So Zynga came came to the Japanese market. They acquired a, a local a, a local game company. The tragedy of the story is they acquired the, absolutely the right one. Um, so I think it's more of a more of a coincidence than actual you know analysis and you know actually like uh, you know um, uh, you know a targeted approach by them. But they did acquire the right one. They staffed up uh, I think until. 80 people or 90 people or something like that into in, in the local uh, Tokyo studio. And from one week to the next, they uh, closed down the studio because uh, back then the CEO said, you know, the, uh, the Japanese market is not so sexy for us anymore. They closed everything down and just went. And I know that because um, one of my friends was uh, their last hire 
and uh, uh, he got a phone call one day, and you know somebody told him you don't you don't have to be you don't you don't have to come to the office on on uh, Monday, uh, you know because we are not operating the Japan business uh, the Japan office anymore. So it was a very ad hoc decision by that. So that was uh, that was the biggest the biggest uh, uh, flop. I think that the second biggest flop was, and I'm not saying that to mock these companies, it's extremely difficult. Uh, I'm just saying that, you know, from a historical perspective, uh, there's a big, big list of uh, uh, companies that have failed in the Japanese market. Again, no mocking at all. Um, And uh, the the second big one is King. Uh, They also opened the Japan office much more more cautious than Zynga. The office was much smaller. And they were talking about creating a Japanese content locally for a local audience for some time. That never happened. They closed down uh, the uh, the local office uh, a couple of uh, a couple of uh, uh, weeks ago. Um, and you know the, you have also a, a list of uh, European companies like Wuga, for example, from Germany. Good Games from Hamburg. They all had offices. A Machine Zone has a Japanese entity in in here in here in uh, Tokyo. Um, and uh, you, you know uh, uh, what I'm trying to say is, Supercell is, I think, the only uh, Japanese company that has an, uh, that has an office, an entity here in Japan that is still kind of doing okay from uh, from uh, to, to some to, to some extent. They have been doing okay for a long time with Clash of Clans. But uh, what I'm trying to say is, from a Western perspective, uh, I, I think that I cannot even tell you one. A Western company at the moment that has actually established a presence, then cultivated a local user base, you know, um, uh, you know, created you know uh, uh, relations with media, with other developers, with publishers, with uh, with UA channels, and that actually you know expanded into a large Japanese uh, you know uh, subsidiary. That has actually never really happened. Interesting. Yeah, that's you know kind of what my sense of things was that no one's really had you know a great success. Um, so it seems like, you know, the strategy you mentioned, obviously from the UA perspective is you can do a lot on the channels that you're used to using and you can do it sitting in, you know, wherever you are, uh, in your home base. And that's probably, you know, a pretty good, you know, uh, (laughs) that's pretty, pretty good, pretty safe amount of effort, a pretty good amount of effort in terms of, you know, investing in Japanese market. Um, is there any other, you know, sort of, accessible steps someone can take to be more successful in Japan besides that, um, maybe from the content or operation side, customer, customer support, that kind of stuff. Uh, Yeah. I think that, you know, from the content perspective, I would say uh, leave your uh, foreign content foreign. You know, don't try to like try to Japanize them, you know, make your characters uh, hair blue instead of black or fa- something like that. That does not really work. I think it works in, in China to some extent, uh, you know, if you localize the content there because the gamer culture or the, uh, you know, uh, the sophistication of the user base is different. Uh, but uh, the Japanese uh, uh, gamers are extremely critical extremely, extremely critical, very knowledgeable um, about, uh, even, even about mobile games. You know, you usually have that, have that, uh, have that kind of uh, a characterization in the West for console gamers or for, for PC gamers that, you know, are very active and, you know, try to, uh, try to inform themselves about, uh, about the content. But uh, here in Japan, that expands also to mobile users. Uh, so I would say that, you know, leave the content, uh, leave your foreign content foreign. Um, and I think that uh, there are counterexamples to what we talked about earlier. Uh, you know, you don't need to have, so I understand, you know, some, in some cases, you know, developers want to have a Tokyo office because it's cool, right? Because they want to raise the valuation because it sounds cool, because they want to have somebody here, you know, that, that takes care of, the, of their business. I understand that. Again, I'm not mocking at all. Uh, is, uh, 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 and uh, I think that, uh, I think though, that you don't need to do that when you want to become, when you want to be successful in the, in the Japanese market. It also depends on what you define as successful. Do you want to have like a multi-million dollar hit or do you want to have an ROI, uh, you know, ROI positive um, effort when it comes to the Japanese market? I can give you one uh, current up-to-date example. Um, and, you know, these guys have been doing a terrific job for one to two years, at least now in the Japanese market. And I can say that because I never worked with them so they did that completely independently and unfortunately they never asked me and it's play rigs so play rigs uh so i always tell clients you know look what play rigs has been doing we look at play, what what these guys have been doing and do exactly the same thing that they have been doing in the japanese market and um and uh, and uh, uh, there's a good example for you on how to do things right at least in my perspective as a western mobile game developer in the japanese market so, so I don't, I don't know. What are they doing? What are the kind of cu- couple of things that they're doing really well? 
Yeah, I think that they're not go- going crazy. That's, uh, th- that's point one. You know, they're just applying common sense. They, you know, they're not coming here with 20 people opening an office and, you know, uh, and saying, you know, we are the best. We are, we are trying to teach you how things are done, uh, you, know, and th- you know, things like that. I think that they are um, uh, very, uh, very, very focused um, and they are doing, uh, you know, UA Again, I'm not I'm not working with them, so it's it's my assumption uh, that my strong assumption that they are doing at least most of the UA, maybe not all, but most of the UA locally at their not here in Japan, but at their at their home base. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, uh, I'm sure that they are because uh, you know uh, the, the games are so their games are so scaled right now. I'm sure that they have some kind of collaboration partner for for the UA side of things. Uh, but it looks to me like uh, most of the activities are controlled by Playrix themselves. Um, and uh, what they did is they left the foreign content foreign. So there's not an, not even a, a, you know a pixel that has been uh, you know changed for the for the Japanese market ex- except for the translation of the text, of course. Um, and they are very very successful with it. You know these guys these guys uh, are uh, charting with uh, gardenscapes, with homescapes, and you know with that uh, with that with that kind of series of uh, of uh, of uh, Japanese uh, of, um, of of their of their IP that they are sitting on. And I think. I think what they did very well is they understood that they're actually bringing something new to the table, right? So the, the games like that uh, have not really existed in the Japanese market, believe it or not. Um, just like, you know, NetEase brought Battle Royale to, to the Japanese audience, uh, Playrix brought that kind of like, uh, that kind of like hybrid games uh, to, to the Japanese market. Um, and, uh, you know, the graphics are still foreign, but not, not too far away from the Japanese taste. So they kind of like found a sweet spot in terms of uh, a genre, a fit, uh, a fit, fit, fitting the genre and fitting the graphics uh, and fitting the gameplay into these, into these, uh, into that kind of, uh, into that kind of uh, uh, Japanese, uh, uh, you know, user base that we have here. Very, very clever, uh, very, very, uh, very clever company. Uh, at least when it comes to the Japanese market. Yeah, no, that's interesting because I think one of my hypotheses, you know, for you know, it's a similar thing in Korea where you see, you know, every all the games follow the same sort of, you know, genre strategy. Is that you know, I think people feel like they have to fit within those, that sort of, uh, you know, RPG or whatever it is, but there actually is more of an appetite for some of these other types of gameplay experiences. Um, and that's where I think the foreign companies have an opportunity, right? Cause they can take those, they're doing different stuff and, and can, can take those risks. So, uh, you know, we're, we're com- getting, getting towards the end here, but I've, you know, we talked about NetEase uh, and Knives Out would love to hear. I mean, I think two questions. One is, what is what you know why is that working um and and And, and also if i can interject one question and do do they have a local office in japan to service knives out as as well sorry sorry yeah so yeah so netty is like why is that you know what are they doing to make that work so well uh, yes, yeah, so, so it's a couple of things. Uh, they have, they do have an office. I mean, it's, it's a, as you know, it's a huge publicly traded uh, company in in China. For them, it's not a big deal, you know, to open to open an office and you know hire some people locally. It's not really. It's just like a drop in the ocean for them from a cost perspective. Um, and uh, uh, but uh, 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 you know, uh, Knives Out was not their first game in Japan. So one point is to to to, to uh, Josh's uh, Josh's uh, Josh's uh, question is uh, that they had experience in the, in the Japanese market before launching Knives Out. Not too much but you know they've been operating games for uh, you know for a while here in japan before that game came out the second point is timing you know uh, you know knives out was the first battle royale game on mobile uh, that launched here here in japan before fortnite before PUBG came and before any of the now there are, are, there's a whole pool of them um and uh, so it was t- uh, you know um the experience the initial like limited but still some experience uh, uh, running uh, running games launching and running games in japan uh, the timing and as, as a third the quality of the game it's actually a very well made uh, battle royale game my per- it's not my personal favorite my personal favorite is fortnite um, and uh, Apex Legends on uh, console, just as a side note. But uh, it's it's a very well done uh, battle royale game, optimized optimized for mobile phones. And I believe that NetEase understood. Um, you know, they applied common sense. They understood. They launched the game. It caught on. And then because NetEase is, is a Chinese company, they operated with China speed, not with Japan speed, but with China speed. And they just threw money at the problem, right? They just launched uh, launched the game. They saw it's working. They saw it rising in the top grossing rankings in Japan. And what they did was they, uh, you know, they... Uh, super aggressively marketed the game. So there's t- TV commercial campaigns, uh, you know, of course the typical UA channels on the online. And what they also did is they uh, brought uh, marketing offline. 
right? So they had a very Japanese uh, approach. So the game is Chinese, but uh, UA is totally Japanese, very aggressive. TV, again, TV commercials, uh, to give you one example, they had, an offline, uh, they had an offline event for fans of the game where I think a couple of hundred people came. Uh, in the US, people would say, you know, this is not scalable. Why are you even doing this? You know, like, you know, you, you rent a hall and, you know, you invite 200 fans of the game. They play games to, uh, with each other. And, you know, what's even the point? In Japan, you know, this is called fan service. Right. So uh, they did that. They invited people, uh, you know, people from the media and people from the media like started covering the game and very, very Japanese uh, uh, kind of like marketing, uh, um, uh, marketing games. And they, uh, they've been doing that uh, for, uh, for quite a while now. Um, and uh, I think that uh, I think that, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think they basically operated. I think that the uh, uh, operated. Uh, and are still operating the game just like a local, just like a local game studio. Just a very, very well-made, uh, uh, you know, effort from from NetEase for that game. Got it. And so, uh, it seems my sense is that the opportunity for when we talk about foreign companies, there's a pretty strong opportunity for uh, foreign, if you will, com companies in Asia. So especially Korea and China. Um, you know, uh, there's, we were looking at the top grossing charts. There's, uh, you know, a few titles in there. There's, you know, six waves that brought over, a you know, Chinese game that's done pretty well. So can you talk a little bit about like kind of what's happening there? Is the content just more relevant? I mean, obviously, we, you know, people think of Asia and, and this, if you don't know enough, you sort of assume, you know, oh, it's one, you know, market. But the reality is like between the, the countries, a lot of themes are very, very different, but does it have more potential from the theme side? Are they just executing better? The games, you know, resonate better with, you know, what is it? Why is that opportunity greater? I think from the Korean Chinese companies um, and how have they been able to sort of make inroads where the Western Western developers haven't. Right, right. I think that, you know, if you look at, if you think about the uh, Asian market, there's no Asian market, right? I mean, I know, Josh, you know that, but, uh, and I know, I, I think that a lot of also the listeners know that, but, uh, uh, but I think that Japan, China, Korea are very, very different from each other. And then there's also the Southeast Asia bucket. And even in Southeast Asia, uh, you know, it's not really all the same. Vietnam, yeah. Philippines, you know, and, you know, all of these countries, they are not really, uh, you know, the same kind of gaming market. There's a lot of differences between even, the, uh, even that, uh, inside that part of the, of the region. I think that the answer to your question is that, you know, these, uh, uh, these game, uh, these uh, the studios that are coming from these countries are operated by people and uh, that are culturally, uh, historically, geographically, also from a business pers uh, culture perspective, they're closer to the Japanese market. Right, so they know, uh, you know. Uh, I think that there's a certain understanding that the understanding of uh, the Japanese culture is uh, stronger for a you know random J Chinese person or somebody from Hong Kong or from Korea. They know uh, Japan just better than uh, you know a Western uh, a Western person would, just because of the reasons that I, uh, uh, that, that I mentioned. Another point is, I think that if you look at uh, uh, the the way that uh, you know Chinese and Korean games are presented, uh, you know. The, the graphics uh, and you know game mechanics also very RPG heavy for example it's just closer to the uh, to, to the typical uh, Japanese uh, experience and if I may add this very quickly because I think it's important um, you know the monetization is also a lot closer uh, to what we have here 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 in in Japan we talked briefly about uh, gacha you know I would say that uh, a lot of uh, Chinese games and Korean uh, Korean made games have gacha as their main monetization mechanic and that just works in Japan in Japan I would say that the discussion, is flipped on on uh, on its head. So in the West, you know, people are are thinking that you know, gacha as from a user perspective, you know, users are thinking that it's a predatory uh, kind of mechanic. In some cases, not not every every user thinks that, but it's a uh, unfair. It's like uh, too much like gambling, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Here in Japan, I would make the case that uh, people expect gacha in their mobile games. And this is something that uh, that uh, Chinese and uh, Korean ga uh, games are are uh, you know are implementing, right? And, you know, they just export that monetization together with the games to the, uh, to, uh, uh, to the Japanese market. And again, I believe that it's, it's a mix between, uh, you know, understanding of, of, of the Japanese market uh, better um, and closer monetization mechanics, game mechanics, uh, genres are closer, imagery is closer, uh, it, it's, it's more similar. Um, and I think that they do have a certain advantage when it comes to these points. Got it, okay. So last question here before you wrap up, you know, we talked about, you know, foreign companies coming into Japan. Um, we've talked about the, you know, local companies focusing on local users. 
So what about, you know, the Japanese uh, publishers focuses, you know, out of market? Um, you know, we talked about DNA and GRI and how that was a whole sort of fiasco, but, you know, mm -hmm. where, where are things at now? Are they, is there any sort of efforts to sort of, you know, focus internationally and, you know, what are, what are companies doing? My sense is that not, not a lot, but I'd love to hear from you what, um, where things are at and what you're seeing. Uh, yeah. So uh, I, as I mentioned earlier, I think that one big point is that, you know, they're taking the international uh, internationalization efforts back into the into the HQ here uh, here in, in Japan. I think that uh, a lot of the co game companies have done that over the last couple of years. The second big point to your question is uh, that uh, the interna uh, the international internationalization efforts have been scaled back. So just because you know bring, you bring back the interna internationalization efforts to your home base doesn't mean that you know the uh, the, the level of internationalization goes down. But I think it did um, over the last over the last uh, couple of years. So you have a lot less titles and a lot less work uh, you know that is being invested into bringing games uh, in, into bringing games outside of Japan. And as a third point, uh, you know, which a little bit contradicts to what I just said, but only to some extent is that the internationalization in recent years have, has, has been focused on uh, Asia. So you now have a lot more game companies here in Japan that are focusing on Korea and on China and uh, some, of the, uh, some of the Southeast Asian uh, markets at, at, the expense of, uh, at the expense of the West. And increasingly, uh, if I may add this quickly, India is getting into, into focus for a lot of game developers. So Square Enix uh, CEO just recently said, I think just last week, he said that uh, he sees, he identified internally at Square Enix, they identified uh, you know, uh, India as the next big uh, frontier uh, for, uh, for growth for their mobile and maybe even for their, uh, uh, for their PC and uh, console games. Interesting. Um, JK, any questions before we do the final the final word here no it's all all sounds great awesome all right so Sirkin, you know obviously we've we've talked about a lot of different stuff um you know for our listeners what are kind of uh the t what are the top three takeaways that you think uh you know people should take away that they need to understand about the japanese gaming market um if they can only take away three things what, what would you make sure people people remember if you allow me to say, say it maybe in one sentence, uh, you sure. know, uh, it's, I think it's, uh, uh, Japan is a very competitive market, but it, I think that if you do it as a Western developer, if you do it in a clever way, there are still opportunities uh, uh, here in, in the Japanese market, as, ex as exemplified by companies like Playwix, for example, or, you know, or, uh, you know other companies like uh, Peak from uh, Turkey. Uh, you know, which is also doing a pretty good job uh, in in uh, in operating uh, their big game, Toon Blast, here on the Japanese market. So it's not impossible. Got it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much Great. for uh, for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for your time, Sir Khan. Definitely appreciate no it. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, guys. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.